Oh, we don't need no fancy words. I mean, we need to practice. We need to rehearse. I'll tell you what we need. We need some paying gigs. We don't need this messing around, first one patio and then another, and that's ridiculous. Amen. We don't got no goddamn patio! 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 All right, hello, and welcome to the No GD hey, Band Podcast. Hey, I'm Chris. And I'm Henry, and we're waiting on Jeff Jackson to arrive, and he'll be here probably in about 15 minutes. Yeah, we didn't, want to, we didn't want to bore him with the mundane aspects of the opening of the podcast, so we thought we'd go ahead and cover all that before we got here. Yeah, I know. A little bit of behind the scenes for you folks out there. Henry, last week's episode, uh, I didn't look at the numbers, but you told me we, we really... We popped up somehow, man. I don't I know what it is. Awesome. I think it's great. <laughs> uh, we just got to thank everybody out there who listened because yeah. I want to think it's the quality of the uh, audio recording because we did a few behind the scenes tricks, but it probably wasn't that. But I feel a lot better about that episode, like audio wise. I apologize. It kind of evens out with everybody else is doing them. You know? Yeah, it's like you don't have to. I didn't have to I turn did, it way up. To did you hear, hear room noise? I like room noise because it reminds me of like records. Compared yeah. to what yeah. we were hearing before the edit, no. <laughs> but um, I, what I like is I don't like when people are trying to listen to a podcast and ours is like so much quieter than like This American Life or whatever. That was kind of upsetting me. So I think we kind of fixed that. I was super excited about that. So again, thanks to all the new folks that listened and. Um, Thanks to all the people that have listened to all of them. I, I wanted to start this segment off too, Henry, by saying I got some feedback from multiple folks siding with you on the Panthergate debate. Well, we how had. did they dress you down over this? Is what I well, want to well, know. Because I know that they were going to agree with me, but I just want to know. Here's the first thing. I, I was, what, there was, a, there was a sentence I said in there um, uh, that I think a lot of people missed. I am not condoning <laughs> assault. So, I, yeah, the guy that, the young man that hit the other guy was in the wrong. Yeah. Okay. I really, you know, I I was trying to express the feeling, uh, the frustration that that guy had, I can empathize with. I didn't get that across very well. uh, Everyone was like, why would you hit somebody, man? That sucked. (laughs) Not in that voice. Most people were like, why would you hit somebody? Um, But anyway, yeah, I don't condone hitting people at a Panther game. I do, however, condone that guy's feeling. (laughs) So, uh, you know, that's... Are you allowed to sit? I mean, you are allowed to sit. You're 65 years old. You're allowed to sit and watch the game. Mm. You know? It's only, it's, it would only be nice for those folks to sit down and let him watch. You know? Mm. I still don't agree with that part. But, uh, yeah, okay, so I didn't have anybody back me up on that part either. So you guys are all wine and cheesers. I love you for it. Henry, you should, be, you should be a Panther fan, okay? Mm. You're a wine and cheeser. Mm. Yeah, so those are the big things I had early on. Do you want to go ahead and get to the whiskey? Sure. We ought to pop that open before we have a state senator come in the kitchen. So let's uh, right, let's do it. Let's do it. Take the edge off. The effects the whiskey may be having on my body. All right, so what'd you bring us All tonight? Right, we got Jack Daniels. You brought JD. Good old, yeah, you know, you know up from Jim Beam. Uh, Megan asked me, uh, Megan is my wife, for those of you who don't know. Megan asked me last night, she said, you know, you have a state senator come in. What type of uh, whiskey are you bringing? And I was going through all the fancy stuff in my head, literally, when you texted and go, Jack Daniels? I was like, sure. That's the one. Sure, that's fine. So it's that's Jack Daniels. Jeff Jackson for Jack Daniels? Yeah, and Jeff hopefully... Hopefully he'll want some. We don't know. We'll go ahead and pour him a little, and um, we'll see you on the other side, guys, with special guest, State Senator Jeff Jackson. Jeff Jackson. The effects the whiskey may be having on my body. (laughs) Okay, so we're back uh, from the whiskey portion. We just introduced the whiskey, and we did pour one for uh, State Senator Jeff Jackson. We met him on the porch. Is actually in the kitchen. Welcome... To the kitchen. You got a nice kitchen. Thank you. I was clean, that. It's tidy. <laughs> this is what we do every week. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, spacious. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. But thank you for coming out. So we are doing a, another political episode, and this one's going to be exciting and fun. It's going to be mostly about gerrymandering and why it's important to you, the listener, and why it's important to all of us. And we figured you were the expert to talk about it. So can I just turn it over to you and let you introduce the, the whys and how-fors of it? Yeah. Henry's that okay with you? Yeah. Okay, great. So 
most people, well, not most people, those people who know what gerrymandering is know that it's bad, but few of them understand just how bad it is. It's one of those situations where the closer you look at it, the worse it reveals itself to be. So I like to start with the bottom line, just in case people are not interested in this subject whatsoever and they're inclined to listen to anything else. I try to grab people's attention by saying, did you know 90% Mm -hmm. of your state legislators are invulnerable in a general election? A full 90% of us can do virtually nothing to lose to the extent of endorsing our opponents or participating in television debates with sock puppets. I mean, you can take it to an extreme, and the thesis still stands that virtually none of us can lose a general election because we have let politicians draw the districts. My party was in charge for a really long time in North Carolina, and we failed to end gerrymandering, and we relied on it. And now the other party is in charge, and they're giving it way better than they ever got it because they've got computers and data, and they can be really surgical about it. And so the, the first result is that 90% of us can't lose. The second order consequence is that it has shifted our politics very far to the right because all you have to do as a Republican in the General Assembly to stay in charge to keep your majority is not lose your primary. Right. 10% of the state votes in a Republican primary. So the last presidential race we had with like uh, Trump and Ted Cruz and Jeb Bush and all them, 10% mm-hmm. of North Carolina voted in that primary. That 10% is now the legislative filter for the entire state. Because if you're a Republican in the state legislature, you're in the majority and you're not going to face almost over the vast majority of them. You're not going to face a general election that you have to worry about. So as long as you win your primary, you're good. So all they do is pander to the 10 percent of North Carolina that votes in Republican primary. That's why things have gotten so weird in the last five years. That's why we're in court all the time. That's why we're in late night comedy routines all the time. It's why um, we're in national headlines all the time. It's why HB2 happened. Right. And then it's why HB2 wasn't repealed once it became a clear economic disaster for the state, even though the vast majority of legislators in private wanted to repeal it, even Republican legislators. Um, So weird things happen. There's this distortion that takes place when the only election you can lose is a primary. Well, and also, and I, just to be clear, and I know this is how I feel about it, but and I, and I like to try to think I'm this way on most issues. I would be against this, whether it was my team, the Democrats, or the Republicans or the doing this. Right. I'm, I, right. So it's this is not because I, I, I can hear the argument already. Like, well, the Democrats did it for however many years, so we have a blank check to do it, which you probably face when you're in Raleigh. Like. Look, your party did this for years and years, so it's fine for us to play this way. And you just got to acknowledge that. You don't want to dodge that, even though it's not, there is not, there's no real moral equivalence on this when you actually dive into the details. I mean, one, both parties have categorically participated in the same behavior. Mm -hmm. One just took it to a whole new level. But that, I mean, you have to acknowledge my party had the ability to end this. All the Republicans who were in charge right now when they were in the minority, they all filed bills to end gerrymandering through independent redistricting. And mm-hmm. my side threw all those bills in the trash can. Right. We never thought we'd be out of power. Right. Which, which sometimes I feel like they feel that way right now, too. Or they're trying to shore things up so that they... This whole thing that came up, and you can speak to this better than I can, recently with the judges where they're trying to circumvent the governorship on yeah. that. Um, it seems like they are just trying to, to shore up their hold for like a lifetime. I think they can feel that the pendulum is going to swing back on them, um, particularly because of national politics. Cause I mean, to be honest, national politics has way more influence over state legislative races than anything. The, the state legislative candidates really? are doing. Absolutely. Huh. Well, let me, let me, let me ask you this question about, and you can tell me if this is an, uh, I'm just reading articles that are terrifying me, but is there uh, on a national level? So they control, The Republicans control 32 state houses currently. That's right. If they could get the 35, they could call a constitutional convention to change the United States Constitution. Right. And they would only need 38 states' approval to ratify that. Is that the underlying goal? (laughs) No, I don't think that's the underlying goal. I think the underlying goal is just kind of... To control states. Yeah, you know... know, not only to control individual states, but to control the pipeline for your senators and your congressmen and and congresswomen. Because 
it's so difficult now to find uh, Democrats in a lot of these states because normally they come up through the state legislature. Right. So when you're trying to recruit for U.S. Senate or U.S. Congress, it's really hard. You got to go, you know, you got to go to city council. You got to go to county commission. Um, so we just don't have as many opportunities. The Republicans have this bench now for at least the next two decades right. of people that they, they've got this huge field team now that they can recruit from to run for higher office. That's a big part of the plan. Right. So, and, and also on a, on a state level, I guess we're seeing it already, but with the supermajority that they currently have, are you seeing, are we seeing their agenda right now or do they have an agenda statewide that they're not even, they haven't even really laid out yet, that they're really wanting to lay out? You've seen most of their agenda. So the first big piece of their agenda was to gerrymander to make sure they protected their majority. The second big piece of their agenda, really the first big thing they wanted to get done was massive tax cuts overwhelmingly for wealthy people. And look, I don't care what you think about tax cuts. Um, it is simply true that the vast majority of the tax cuts went to the wealthiest people in the state and that as a result, we have significantly underfunded education. All of the money for tax cuts, all, not all, but almost all of the money, the vast majority of the money that we use for tax cuts comes straight out of public education in North Carolina because of the way we do our budget. We got $23 billion budget. But now you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you as a Democrat, you weren't even allowed to sit in on the debate for the budget. No, no, no. We're not allowed to have any significant input on any really significant piece of legislation. How frustrating is that when you're up there? Like, well, I, I can't imagine. I would have just walked out. Like, I, I don't think I have the... It's, it's, it's bad, right? Is, but, is it all, like, does it feel like urban versus rural when you're there? Well, that's the other thing. There is a real urban versus rural, and there's, there are things that the urban legislators could do if, if we were actually a part of the conversation and a part of the table to help heal that divide. But that divide is being deliberately accentuated huh. because the folks, the, the legislators who are from rural North Carolina think it's to their political advantage to look like they're beating up on urban North Carolina, which is why HB2 was great for them. Even once it became an economic and it, disaster. And even hmm. the economic piece, though, they thought, well, that mostly affects the cities, that's not right. us. So that's fine. It's really not a problem. For them politically, they're not going to lose votes back home because they're costing Charlotte $500 million mm-hmm. for this punitive piece of legislation that does nothing other than bleed the state dry. They're not going to lose any votes back home. Right. Well, and it looks to me like this is just a microcosm of national politics as well because I feel like the whole... Uh, populist Trump movement, if that's what you want to call it, is a rural versus urban. Most urban cities, if you looked at it, most cities were, I think the stat that I pulled was, of the top 100 largest cities, 87 of them uh, voted for Hillary Clinton. She won by, in those cities alone, by 14.7 million votes. You're right. And there are a lot of arguments that I, that you know, Democrats can make about why that's not fair or why we're sad that's the case. I would say the onus is on the Democrats to be more aggressive in reaching out to rural North Carolina and rural all parts of the country with a real economic message, which Hillary Clinton did not have. Hmm. Hillary Clinton's economic message was three things, higher minimum wage, paid family leave, and equal pay for women. All good issues, but none of those comprise a bold economic message that's going to matter to these post-industrial parts of our state or our nation where all the jobs left but all the people have stayed. Minimum wage? Paid family leave? That that just doesn't move the needle in these communities. And Trump was talking right at these people, saying, I will bring back the jobs. It was fantasy, and -hmm. it was tinged with racism, but he always spoke directly to them. We didn't even try because the underlying problem is automation. And that problem is hard to right, solve. Right, and it, but it's, it's a reality, but yeah, you don't want right. to... The vast majority of manufacturing jobs we've lost over the last 15 years have been due to automation, not trade. Correct. But it's easier to make it about trade, because if you make it about trade, you can make it about people who speak a different right, language right, right. and worship a different god right. and have a different skin pigment. It's just easier to right. demonize it. Automation, the answer most of it is education. Right. And nobody really wants to hear that. Well, and the other thing, too, is uh, my wife is a uh, native... Uh, Pittsburgh, and so when we go back to her small town outside of Pittsburgh, all of her, that whole area is Union, and they all voted uh, solidly Democratic until second term Obama, and I can firsthand tell you a lot of that was straight, just straight racism, Um, but I think 
where the Democrats, especially with Hillary Clinton, miscalculated was they thought they had those people in their hip pocket no matter what, and they didn't. So that was a problem, too. But let me ask you a, a radical question about this, because I don't have to deal with it like you do right up there day to day. Do you not think at some point in the future we're going to have to change the system, whether it's redistricting radically or something, to where the majority of the people now live in cities across the country, and they, they should be properly represented? I, I, I feel like rural folks' values are so different, and there's so few of them. It's like 30% of the population is uh, running the show. You know, if you go back to the conversation that the founders had, this was kind of the big sticking point, and it manifested itself in a lot of different ways and in different parts of the constitutional debate, but it was about this grand bargain of how do we all hang together despite the fact that we have rural areas and urban areas and kind of different sets of cultural values. I mean, Mm -hmm. the debate had a different vocabulary around it, but in a lot of ways it was the same debate. We're going to hang together. We're all going to prosper together. There are a few things procedurally and structurally that we got to work out, like you can't let politicians draw the districts. I'm hopeful the Supreme Court is about to come through there and, and give us a real assist. So can you can you give us a little background on that? I think you're talking about Gill versus Whitford. Whitford. Yeah, Whitford. the Wisconsin case. So what's cool about this is that, and what's really optimistic about this, is that about 50 years ago, the Supreme Court pulled itself out of the game or, or declared that it was not going to adjudicate matters of political gerrymandering because it was worried that it was this thicket, this swamp, and every squiggle of every line would be litigated and the court would be endlessly involved in determining what was and wasn't a political gerrymander. Did you draw this line because that's the way it needed to be drawn or are you trying to help your party? And who the heck knows? The thing is, now we have these really good mathematical models that show the court objectively when it's happening. There are a couple of different models that have been created. One of them is the one that was offered in the Gill versus Whitford case, um, the efficiency gap or the wasted vote model. And so that was the one that was being offered to the Supreme Court. There's also there's a separate model that's being litigated through the North Carolina uh, courts right now that could also be a potential option for the court. But the whole point is that we now can show the court, look, you have an objective tool. You don't have to worry about being lost in this swamp. So please put some outer limits on what politicians can do when it comes to political gerrymandering. Say that something is beyond the pale, because if you don't, they will continue to cheat. My party will cheat in states like Illinois and Maryland, and the Republican Party will cheat in every southern state. Right. You've got to put democracy is choking because of gerrymandering, and you can't simply walk by without rendering aid anymore, Supreme Court. I get that this is tricky, but it's just going to have to be tricky. And is it is it not? So my, my understanding of it was as well, so the, the Supreme Court struck down our districts, the North Carolina Supreme Court, based on racial gerrymandering. So the, it's a little, it's the federal court the federal here court in North Carolina court. struck it down because of racial gerrymandering. So racial gerrymandering has been against the law the whole time, pretty much. Articulating exactly what racial gerrymandering is is a little tough, but the Republicans helped us out because they admitted that when they drew all of these districts, the North Carolina congressional districts and the the state legislative districts in 2011, they started by drawing all the African-American districts, and they had a strict rule. They said each one of them, and there are 28 in our legislature, our state legislature, has to be at least 50% African-American. And the court said, when you created that strict rule without justifying it, without saying we need 50% in order to make sure that these communities can can be represented by African-Americans, uh, that that violated the Constitution. Right. So all 28 of those districts had to be redrawn. That's not a ruling about political gerrymandering. That's, that's racial. The, that's but, racial. Which is legal. Like political gerrymandering is political legal. Political gerrymandering is legal, which is why when the Republicans drew all the lines, they explicitly said, we are going to um, commit a political gerrymander, and we are going to draw these lines to make sure as many Republicans win as possible. That's, that's what I didn't, I didn't the, think but, people, people understood. So when it, when it got thrown back to them, they said, we're going to redraw these, but we are going to do it on a political gerrymander. They correct. were open about it. That's but correct. isn't that Wisconsin case primarily about... A, a political gerrymandering and determining whether so that's it, they constitutional meant, on its that's face. It. So that's that, why that's the that's big why kahuna. It's important. And that's it may it. and it may have to be thrown back to the court again. If 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 the Supreme Court says you can't political gerrymander, then someone's going to sue on these lines here in North Carolina and have it overturned. 
again. Well, we really need the Supreme Court to come through for us on this Gill versus right. Whitford case. Right. If they don't, then they're basically saying for another you can couple it. of generations. Read the tea leaves, Jeff. What do you think is going to happen? Well, it all comes down to Justice Kennedy. So a lot of people say, well, because Gorsuch made it onto the court, then this is a lost cause. Not the case, because Gorsuch replaced Scalia. Right. Scalia was always a, a lost vote on this issue. Mm-hmm. It has always been about Justice Kennedy. So we know it's going to be four on one side and four on the other. It's going to be a five four decision. Mm -hmm. Um, It all comes down to him. In the argument, all of the arguments were made basically explicitly to Justice Kennedy. I mean, it was obvious during the oral arguments. I think he's going to come through. I think he's going to put some outer limits. He's getting ready to leave the court. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that he's sent, as far as tea leaves, very clear signals. He's getting ready. I think he's getting ready to throw a thunderbolt that reshapes politics across the country. I mean, look, in about 40 states, none of the congressional representatives have any real chance of losing in a general election. Hmm. That's why we're so screwed. That's why <laughs> politics has become epically bad. I mean, it's been bad before. It's become truly, heinously terrible. Can, yeah, can, 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 you, can you throw a Trump victory under the, the uh, I'm probably using the wrong analogy, it, because gerrymandering exists, that no. that happened? Or no. no. You can throw um, the Trump enabling because of gerrymandering, because you've got about... You know, you've got so many Republicans in Congress who can only lose in a primary Mm -hmm. that why not suck up to Trump? Mm -hmm. They face no consequence by enabling him and accommodating him. They only face a consequence if they do what most of them want to do, which is what Senator Flake just did, which is stand up and say, this is nuts. Okay, but here is, and you you correct me if I'm wrong on this, the thing that's really got under my skin about the Corker Flake thing is, the guys only had backbone when they were retiring. When he's leaving. I yeah. Know. I know. It's I mean, I, I feel so like what's So why not? The majority of mainstream Republicans feel the way they feel. Yes. They just don't have the stones to stand up and say it because, like what you're saying, they won't, they, they're facing this. Well, they want the tax cuts. It's right. a very transactional thing for them. Uh, Senator Tillis actually gave an interview yesterday uh, with Politico, and he used the phrase transactional like six or seven times because – that's the situation they're in. They want something out of Trump. They want these tax cuts. It's their number one goal. Here in North Carolina, when the Republicans took over, that became their number one goal. And every single year, they have delivered on cutting taxes to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's what they're trying to do nationally. They'll, they know Trump will sign anything they put in front of him. Right. Anything they put needs, in front of him. Because he wants to win. win. Right. And he's comfortable that with his base, he can spin whatever he signs into a win. Right. So he's a, he's a pen to right. them. Well, let's uh, take a quick break here and refresh our whiskey glasses if everybody's good. Sounds and, good. Uh, we'll come right back uh, with the second half. All right, we have more whiskey. Were you in the Senate when the whole... Um, getting rid of the movie, the tax credit for the movie industry. We, I, we have a lot of friends that were. I got that. there. Okay, um, it was a that shame. Was one of the dumbest. It was absolutely a self-inflicted economic. It wasn't load. even pro-business. It was like anti-business. Look, I will spend a buck to make two, and right. that's kind of the end of the debate for me on film. Yeah, me too. It's not a cultural thing where oh, it's nice, it's it's cachet, it's cool. I'll spend a buck to make two. We were making money. I know. I and just, we just wrapped up a whole industry, and we gave it to Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. They right. have made billions of dollars. I know. It's one of those things where I was like, I would like to hear firsthand from somebody that was sitting there, if, if you had been there at the time, like, what was going on at that at that point? Well, here's what was going on. They were doing their, big, their first big tax cut, and they needed to find revenue everywhere they could outside of public education, which is where most of this money came from, and that was one of the subsidies that they could use, that they right. could eliminate. They also eliminated the earned income tax credit, which is way more consequential, honestly, than the film subsidy. It raised taxes on 900,000 working families. Reagan called the earned income tax credit the most effective poverty weapon in history. Because it helps these families that are just making ends meet be able to make ends meet, and they zeroed it out. Right. It's, it seems like, to me, another, another thing that bothers me about politics in general is just the short-sightedness. Like, a lot of long-term planning gets pushed aside because you're like, this doesn't give me any short-term gain at all. But um, So, before we finish up on gerrymandering, tell us 
and tell the folks out there what they can do to actually help here locally and get involved and try to fix the problem. First of all, if you're listening and you don't vote in off-year elections, I got no use for you. (laughs) There's no excuse for voting in presidential years and then skipping the midterms. Because honestly, the most important election we've had in the last decade was in 2010. Right. It was a midterm election. Right. And that's when all, a lot of Democrats stayed home and a lot of state legislatures flipped red and then they were in control of redistricting. If you don't vote during the midterms, you're making a, you are making a lot of really corrupt politicians really happy. Yeah, I think, I think the Republicans flipped like 11 states in that election. Yeah, it was Because brutal. Democrats don't vote in midterms, midterms for some right. reason. If you've ever posted something angry on Facebook but you haven't voted, you've got your priorities backwards. You've got to at least vote first. Second, specifically about gerrymandering, when you have a chance to talk to your legislator, which you can do more easily than you think, as evidenced by the fact that I'm sitting in a stranger's kitchen That's right. right now, right? <laughs> That's right. Get them on record on this issue because as you said earlier, it is literally indefensible to draw districts to benefit yourself or your party. It is totally unethical. Put the question of legality aside. Put the question of politics aside. There is no ethical defense for drawing districts to make sure you can't lose an election. So ask, corner your legislator or a legislative candidate who you see at some town hall. Put them on the spot on this issue. Will you support independent redistricting? Do you think it's okay that so in a 50-50 state that 90% of you are invulnerable? Do you think that's defensible ethically? Right. Jeff, are there other states that have this that have cracked the code on Absolutely. this and have gotten it right? There are a dozen states that have gotten this like right. Like nonpartisan commissions nonpartisan, and things. And they all basically do it differently, but it breaks down into two camps. There's the way that Iowa did it and the mm-hmm. way that the other dozen states have done it. The way that Iowa did it was they gave it to their shared bipartisan staff. So all these state legislatures, we all have a shared staff, and we revere them for their impartiality. We rely right. on them for um, research and drafting bills. And so Iowa basically gave it to their staff. All the other states have adopted some form of an independent commission. And they range in size from like 9 to 21, and how you get on the commission can be a little different. The rules mm-hmm. are – and then the criteria that that commission gets to look at, that's all different. So every state has has done this slightly differently, but the point is they've all removed politicians from the process. Right. I would take monkeys throwing darts at a board over the process we have right now. So on the website, there's some talk about helping us at least get the supermajority off the table, right? Would that have an impact on gerrymandering in our state? Unfortunately, no. no. So what we're trying to do is break the supermajority, which we're really close to being able to do. It's force... (laughs) It used to be three seats in the House, but uh, Republicans or Democrats switched parties on us today. So now we got to pick up four what? seats in the House. Yeah. I missed that. Yeah, it's in the paper. So Jesus. it's the four seats in the House, which is totally doable out of 120. We can, def- we can certainly pick up four, um, maybe two here in Mecklenburg, and then six in the Senate or six in the Senate. It can be one or the other. And that lets us unlock the governor's veto. The thing is, under our Constitution, the governor doesn't have veto over redistricting. That's a special category of bill that the governor cannot veto. But it would still give him a lot. It would make him the most consequential governor in the country. If we can sustain his veto, all of a sudden this right-wing freight train comes to a sudden halt. Which, let's be honest, he's probably the least consequential right now because of the way things are. I don't know. Because the way they've orchestrated I know you don't want to say that. uh, (laughs) No, and honestly, he's not the least consequential because he's been a very— he uses the Bowie pulpit in a highly effective way. Right. I he's agree a, with that. He's very, very smart tactically. Um, so every time he engages in a political debate, everybody hears his message and it resonates with people. And we really appreciate it because when he rolls into town, all the cameras are on him. When I roll into town, it's just what I post on Twitter, right. honestly. Mm-hmm. He uses that megaphone in a really effective way. But I'd love to unlock his veto. Imagine what happens to public education spending specifically like early childhood and pre-K and teacher pay, if you need that governor's budget, you need that governor's signature on the budget. Right? What happens to teacher pay? If you need the governor's signature on the budget, teacher pay goes up. Right. Pre-K spots go, go up. up. It makes a difference to tens of thousands of kids immediately if we can unlock that veto, even if we don't have a majority. Right, right. I mean, that, that veto power, I, mean, I think a lot of people thought, just by coming out and getting angry about HB2 and voting him in was all we had to do. That was it. Like, 
you know, that's the first step. Right. Second step is give him some relief. Give us, bring politics closer to the center, which is what happens if his veto is unlocked. Doesn't mean Democrats are in charge of anything. Well, do you think right now that there are things, and I I think I might have saw this on your Facebook page, are there things going on in a bipartisan way right now that you think are good? Yes. Is there a lot of good? Yes. Early childhood is the biggest one. So we did some expansion funding there for pre-K last year. We've committed to trying to reduce the wait list. So right now the, the, rule, the law is in North Carolina, if you're a four-year-old and you are at risk, right. um, you, have, you are legally entitled to pre-K, but we don't fund it. So, so much for that legal entitlement. We've got thousands upon thousands of kids on the wait list for pre-K, which is stupid. It's not for the future of our state, for the health of our state. It's just a bad idea. So we've decided to... Um, at least try to eliminate that wait list. That's good. That's bipartisan. I think early childhood education is our greatest opportunity to do something big for the state in a bipartisan way because it's politically feasible, it's fiscally feasible, and it's potentially transformative. It can scale up. Is it something that the that the other side is even interested in? Or absolutely, okay, yeah. And when you talk to them, they want to do it. It just ends up being about money because the first bill they're going to pass of any real substance it's is a, tax. a huge tax cut. So they the first bill this year was an eight hundred not the first bill but the first bill of substance really an eight hundred million dollar tax cut. So for some perspective, we spend about two hundred and fifty million dollars on early childhood. So we, they've done about $3 billion in tax cuts out of a $23 billion budget in the last five years. What could we have done with early childhood if just a fraction of that tax cut had been spent there? We could have revolutionized the space. Right. Earned a lot more money in the long run. Lifted generations of kids out of that poverty cycle, which would lift their kids out of the poverty cycle, right? If these kids aren't on grade-level reading by the end of third grade, if they, they don't get across the literacy bridge, okay? So the literacy bridge is zero to eight. If you don't make it across by age eight, which is the end of third grade, the odds are you're never getting across. Those kids who don't make it across, that's almost all of our high school dropouts. It's almost all of our juvenile delinquents. 85% of our juvenile delinquents are functionally illiterate. Right? So we have to get all of our kids across the literacy bridge. 60% don't make it across right now. But again, part of that is, is that long-term, short-term problem. Which is like short term, I give everybody that wants a tax cut a tax cut, but long term, I know I need to help these kids. But we, right. we got the short term; it's easy because we've got the evidence that this is where the funding should go. This is where the investment should go. But it's twenty years right. to really see the impact. Right. And once you see it, it's going to hit like a ton of bricks. If we can really get all of our kids across the literacy bridge, or even reduce by fifty percent those who aren't getting across, it's going to make an enormous difference across not just the income that they're bringing in, but the government services that they're not requiring. Right. The prisons that we're not... We have 69 prisons in North Carolina. That we have, many? We have more prisons than community colleges oh, wow. in North Carolina. I can't believe that. I mean, 69 that's, that's all, but that's prisons, all, man? That's all you need to say right there. I mean, Anybody want to see 79? Right. No. Anybody want to see 100? I know. I know. It's early childhood, folks. And the other thing, too, is even if you think... Even if you're a tough-on-crime person... We we can't af- we can't afford to continue to just jail. A, I don't know, like Look, I'm twenty a percent of the pop- population. I was a criminal prosecutor before yeah, I joined like the in state Gaston Senate. County, right? In Gaston County, right? Yeah. I had to resign because you're not allowed to be a criminal prosecutor and elected official at the same time. It's not about being tough on crime. It's about the fact that of all the thousands of people that I prosecuted, I can count on one hand the number of people who were evil, who were going to come in contact with the criminal justice system, no matter what. Everybody else, mental health, short term, uh, short term benefit. Oh yeah, well, long term loss. But that's a that's yeah. a good news story too because right now, if you want to get a new felony passed in the general assembly, or you want to up the penalty for an existing felony, that's hard because the the word has gotten out. This is a bad idea. We've gone too far. The pendulum needs to start swinging in the other direction. direction. So even with the most conservative legislators, you're not going to be able right now in the state legislature, absent a really good reason, you're not going to be able to just raise a penalty Hmm. or raise a a sentence. But but because they're finally seeing it as a fiscal problem. Like, we just can't keep putting these people, we can't house them. You know, I think that's part of it. But also, it's been a solid 10 years of people saying, enough. Right. Enough. Right. Right. 
Let me ask you another question. Um, I know we're running out of time, and thank you so Are much again here? for coming in and Dude. being with us. It's a school night. It is a school night. <laughs> yeah, okay. I got two yes. school kids. You got two school kids. You work. You work a. You have an two. Attorney in how old? Charlotte. How old? Yeah. Nine and two. Yeah. And you. So not, not just being a state senator, you work a nine to five job here in Charlotte. Yeah. Probably more than nine to five. But Womble Carlisle Sandwich and Rice PLLC. That's right. We're about to change our name, though. We're about to become really? uh, Womble Carlisle Bond Dickinson. We just merged with this international this, uh, English firm. How much time do you have to spend in Raleigh? As, as a, you know, when you do. This? Well, we've got um, a short session and a long session. Mm-hmm. So the um, odd number of years are the long session, so that's about six months. Mm-hmm. And then the short session is about three months. So over a two-year period, I'll spend nine months in session. But we've had so many of these special sessions. Mm-hmm. I've been in session every month this year. Burning up the road. Burning up the road. Well, thank, I, I assume you've got a job where they're, they're fine they're with that. They're very flexible. I'm really appreciative. I'm also in the National Guard, so I right. got to get a haircut tomorrow because I got drilled this weekend. Well, that's what the other question yeah, I want to ask you about. I read on Wikipedia that you went to Afghanistan, and I know I feel like a lot of time conservatives nationally kind of, I guess they try to dominate that argument with you know you're not allowed to speak to this issue unless you've served. Tell us a little bit about your time in Afghanistan. I was young when I went. I had just graduated from college. Mm-hmm. I enlisted after September 11th. It had never crossed my mind to enlist, honestly, until September 11th. Um, so I joined and was sent to, I had I just gotten promoted. So I wasn't a private any longer. I was a specialist. That's like one step up. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't know when I got there, We the unit that I was in functioned as part of as three-man teams. So I knew who my little three-man team was, me and my two buddies. I didn't know who I was going to be assigned to because we get attached to other units. We showed up to Afghanistan and they said, you're going to be attached to special forces. When you're attached to special forces, that means you're going to be kind of way out in the hinterlands. You know, I grew a beard, not as long as yours. <laughs> really? right, right, not as long as yours. Uh, but that was, you know, you were, we're on orders to grow a beard because you're going to be with the locals, and the locals right. expect men to have beards, right? Um, and just most, like just like here, just like in my house. <laughs> <laughs> most of our missions were about going out and making friends with people, honestly, and so we had water bottles with the Afghan flag printed on them and Frisbees with the Afghan flag printed on them. And we would go out and hand those out and the kids went nuts for them, right? Because we're going in the poorest part of the world, basically. So whenever we went to hand stuff out, they had no concept of standing in line because there's there's never enough to go around. So even though we had a translator and we would say, we have enough for everyone, as soon as they saw the first shiny object, like a water bottle, Mm -hmm. they would all just swarm. Some of our missions were not as friendly, Right, um, but most of our missions were about just generating good goodwill. Goodwill, yeah, and 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 the just the terrain there too. Like, oh man, people, I don't think understand how difficult it is. No. So here's the thing: Afghanistan is a rocky, mountainous desert. So you combine the two least hospitable types of geography, right? The desert and the mountains, and that's what Afghanistan looks like, at least huge portions and you're, of it. And you're humping around that with a 40-pound pack. Yeah, with a pack. And we're going places where the last they heard, the Russians were in town. Wow. And we're saying, no, actually, you have a democracy now. And they're, it's so remote, love. they don't even know. They right? don't know, and they don't care. And how could it, how, why would they possibly care? Right. It doesn't impact their lives whatsoever. Did you feel like sometimes it was, it was almost like we might as well be aliens for I mean, all that? Yeah, yeah, we were. I mean, we were, <laughs> I had a digital camera at the time. Those were kind of new back then. And so I would take pictures of the kids and then show them their pictures, and it was wild. It would cause a riot, (laughs) me just showing the picture. They would all want to see the picture. I mean, when we talk about nation building, we're very optimistic, and we use euphemisms because, oh, it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. No, it's not going to be a challenge. It's going to be next to impossible in places like this, places that time has forgotten. If you actually show up in Afghanistan and look around, if you fly in a helicopter over Afghanistan, it looks like you're flying over the surface of Mars. Hmm. Good luck bringing democracy to Mars. Here are your tools. Some soldiers, some trucks, and some money. Yeah. Good luck. We were really there to try and facilitate a fledgling democracy, and we were very accommodating to the culture. We tried to be. We had obviously some disasters in that area. Uh, but, but, man, we have been trying really hard. And when I go talk to high schoolers today, they remind me they've, we've been in Afghanistan their whole lives. 
They're, I know. They've known nothing but war in Afghanistan. That's what I was thinking. Their I, whole I think there's kids graduating from high school now that were born post 9-11, which is amazing to me. It's just like, wow. Does it feel like that long ago to you guys? No, oh, really. no. It feels like yesterday. Me either. Yeah. No. Did, did something about your military service sort of spur you along? spur you on to 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 being a sort of a public servant like you are but does that inform you or did, did were you thinking about that then at all you know it it has informed me because it's given me the opportunity to see lots of different types of leadership mm-hmm. uh, one of the cool things about being in the army is one you're always part of a team so mm-hmm. it's a lot of practice and working with teams and like group psychology but you're you always have a different leader and you get different levels of leaders and they rotate. So you get to observe all these different types of leadership. Mm -hmm. So you get to learn kind of what not to do and what to emulate. That's been really helpful because I really have moments where I think about, okay, what would, what would Sergeant E do? Like one of my favorite sergeants, right? And then I had a drill sergeant I really admired. So what would this drill sergeant do in this? And there are times when I'm speaking when I can feel myself kind of channeling some of those guys because they're the strongest personal examples that I have mm-hmm. of really strong leaders. But as far as public service generally, that more comes from being a prosecutor and just seeing the net result of too little investment in mental health care, education. As a prosecutor, you're shoveling sand into the ocean all day, every day. And it's a good, honorable job if it's done right. But being part of the legislature was my like once-in-a-lifetime chance to address the pile of sand. Right. My, my goal was to practice law, and I, I wanted to specifically be a prosecutor. That was the job I had in mind when I applied to law school. I liked the idea of never having to make an argument I didn't personally believe in. Mm-hmm. As a prosecutor, you're not there to win. You're not there to convict people and throw them in jail. You're there to seek justice. And if you think the evidence isn't there, it's case dismissed. Right. Or if you think the evidence is there but the circumstances are such that really they deserve a second chance, we can do that too. You get total fidelity to conscience as a prosecutor. I really like that. I also like the idea of being in court every day. I thought that would just be a lot of fun. Um, of all the jobs in the law, that struck me as just the most exciting. And the stories you get are amazing. Right. You don't have to embellish at all. You can just tell people what actually happened. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's a good story. Amazing. People are like, <laughs> no way. He's, he was on the stand and he said that. So it was, it was something that I wanted to do. Um, I would have done it probably for another 30 years if the mayor of Charlotte hadn't been arrested by the FBI. Yeah which then caused him to be replaced Claude by my Felter, state senator, and, and then, then I got picked to replace him. Yeah, right. This is a crazy series of events. I mean, at one point, I was like six weeks away from being in the state senate and had no clue, no clue at all. Like, you right now have no clue at all. I felt like you did right now about your possibility of being in the state senate six weeks from now. Wait, so they, and no they, they approached you, and you were like, What? There were a couple people who approached me, and I said, what? Right. This is not going to happen. Right. <laughs> and um, they said, well, you should, you should put your name forward. And I said, okay, I will. And I told my boss. I was like, look, I'm going to put my name forward. I'm not going to win. I'm not going to be the next state senator from Mecklenburg, so no big deal. Yeah. I don't have to reduce my caseload. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then all of a sudden you were. <laughs> I was. And I had to resign. I lost my job by operation of the Constitution. Well, right? let me ask you this. All right, so I know you won. Um, your, your seat was like 68%, right? No, I was re-elected. Yeah. Re- that's what I meant. Yes. Re-elected. So, so he's no longer Gerald was Ford. He had moved on to being a... Correct. Yes. And yeah. so I, I guess, you know, like gerrymandering, so many people think that it's about gerrymandering uh, districts to uh, uh, of the other party, the Republicans, I guess, right? But, but it's a gerrymandered district as far as the Democrats go. Right. Um, and, uh, Dan Kleinfelter won the same I mean? seat like, with 67%. You reduce, you reduce the Democrat, the, the, That's right. you draw the Democrats together. That makes everybody, all the Republicans, all the Republican districts. Republican well, that's, why, when, that's, that's right. why when he was right. explaining the um, racial gerrymandering, it sound, it, it's insidious because it sounded like a good thing. It sounds like, benevolent. Right, yes, right, right, like, right. Oh, we need I guess to, that's what I'm getting We at. need to make sure they're represented, so we need to put make sure there's enough African Americans in a district. Right. But really what you're doing is you're putting them all in a small enough number of districts that they become inconsequential. Well, what you're doing really right, with right. redistricting, that's, with gerrymandering, is you're ring-fencing all the African right. Americans in the state. So they win with 70 75% of the vote, which seems benevolent like you're helping them out, 
but what you're really doing is making sure that they're now resigned to a permanent minority. And, and I they think arrive the, the, the easy right. way to understand that is to look at the maps when they draw. When you see the maps with all the red and the blue, you're like, Whoa. the crazy looking districts are crazy looking because they're using data to ring fence all the African American right. communities. Right. Well, we want to thank you for coming out. Yep. So much. What one thing I want to say real yes, quick. Yes. Sure. Um, Jeff, one of the reasons that you stuck in my mind um, to try to get you to come into our podcast that day was one one evening, Chris and I were out on our Plaza Midwood bike ride, right? And we were driving around, and we ha- happened to pass through the, the Van Landingham estate, right? And we were sort of at the tail end uh, of that. And as we drove by, you were outside there talking to us in a very genuine, real way. And and that, that that resonated with me far beyond, you know, maybe Facebook posts or whatever. And I, I guess I just wanted to tell you that those things aren't lost on people. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, and because what I, I remember wanted, saying I just wanted to was, thank you for that. Uh, I remember that night because I had a bullhorn and there were like 100 bike riders that showed up. And they gave me a bullhorn. They said, okay, what do you want to say to all these people who don't really know who you are right, right. and don't care about whatever's happening? And I just said... Um, Bike riding at, at night is my number one issue. I remember that. I remember you said <laughs> right. that. I remember that. And I'm yeah. running to make sure I serve. Because I, I looked at Henry and I said, did he just say that? <laughs> and I was like, I think that's Jeff Jack. That's the only Jeff thing Jeff? I could think of that would be That was great. That was great. So if I you ever that. wonder if those things have a net impact on somebody. I appreciate it. They do. Well, I, I, just for the archive so that we have it on tape, do you plan to run for something bigger than state senator in the future? Um, well, look, what I'll say is I've got a nine-year-old and a two-year-old, and that weighs real heavy on any kind of decision. We might have another kid. I would love to have another kid. Um, so that would weigh even heavier than at that point. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I feel pretty good about where I am. I actually can get legislation passed where I am right now. I, I passed a pretty good number of bills in the last session, so I know people think it's hopeless right now and they say oh poor jeff you can't get anything done well that's not true if you're if you're a reasonable person and you're willing to let other people take credit you can actually get a lot of stuff stuff done done, right that's and in dc i don't think they're getting jack squat done no and and it's broken yeah but but he's but but that means yeah he didn't he doesn't really know yet no that's a good way of non-answer answer but i like it yeah it's a non-answer answer answer, but i'd also think it means yes probably I hope so. That's it feels, what we hope so. It no. feels like a yes I mean, whether he wants to say it or not. Be, I don't want to end on like a political answer or anything. Like, yeah, I get it. The, the, the answer is genuinely maybe. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm 35. Yeah. Right? You're so young, man. I don't, I don't owe anybody an answer to this question nope, right now. You don't. You right? Don't. And who knows who else is going to run? There could be some really good people who run, and it's just obvious that they should you know, be before me and that right. they would do a better job right. than I would. So, well, so that we don't end on this question anyway, is there anything that you would like to talk about? That yeah, look, folks, things are going to get better. I know you're frustrated. If you're listening to this, that means you probably also follow the news closely and you're engaged and you're passionate a lot about, about a lot of these issues. Watch that line between skepticism and cynicism. I know it's tempting to slip into cynicism because it feels like once you're cynical, you can never be wrong. You can never be disappointed. And you're, you're really smart now that you're cynical. You're not smart. You're just no longer part of any workable solution. In order to actually make things better, you've got to join a team. You're not going to do it by yourself. Find some group somewhere. It doesn't have to be a party, anything formal like that. Through Facebook, there are a million of these groups have sprung up in all types of flavors since the last election, because of the last election, if you actually want to make things better, find one of those groups, and you are going to be rewarded in spades next year because you're going to see an election that, that changes the narrative about where we are politically as a nation. I really and, believe that in 2018. And you feel, you feel like, from what you're seeing, that it, it... Absolutely. We're recruiting a field of candidates that's going to make you proud. We got some people who have never run for office before, but you know what? They're doctors, they're teachers... They're nurses, they're educators, they're going to make you proud. They're not all going to win, but they're going to make you proud. You're going to want to be a part of this wave. I call it the backlash of basic decency. Right. And it happens in 2018. Right. And you're going to want to be a part of it. The only way to be part of it is to be part of a group. And if you're cynical and your only participation is by tearing people down on Twitter or Facebook, you are useless to what we need to do and what we are going to do. And on election night 2018, you're going to want to celebrate 
with the rest of us. You're not going to want to be behind a screen. You're going to be, you're going to want to be in a crowd of people who you helped, who you worked with. So think about that. Think about what it takes between where you are now and what it's, what it's going to look like on election night and think about the changes you need to make and the phone calls you need to make to become part of something real, something bigger than yourself. Well, on that note, that sounds like a good place to stop. Thank All you right. so much. Go GD Thank Band you. podcast with Jeff Jackson. Woohoo! Current events. I, I think for current events, maybe we ought to start off just by breaking down how badass we were. About <laughs> yeah. And he, he said I should have talked. He had it covered. I mean, he said I should have talked more, but I'm like, man. You got this covered. But, I, but apologize. You had the talk- I apologize. No, I apologize. You should've... had the talking points, and it was uh, it was great. It, it was thrilling. To so, so to watch. the listeners, what you didn't hear uh, when we um, graciously let the senator leave, leave. because he was sit- he sat Our here for senator. forty minutes, which is amazing. Uh, he basically said, "Yeah, uh, the same thing." My wife said. He basically said, "Man, Chris, you were just you kind of." Too much. He didn't use these words, but he basically said, "You kind of cock blocked Henry on the uh, whole questions <laughs> in the first twenty minutes." But. Um, so I apologize, Henry. I got a cold. Man, I, I was ready. I was like, I got to get this No, these he's in. got notes here. I've got notes. He's I've got, got notes. notes on the computer. And I really was just trying to catch his eye and see what I could, could sort of get in edgewise. But um, uh, uh, I was just content to sort of sit here and li- listen to him. The guy tell yeah, me things. Yeah, I mean, it was, an easy, it was easy to do because he just... He doesn't seem rehearsed. No. But he seems to know his shit. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. You know? No, it was it was fairly easy. I I don't know that I'm gonna have to do that much editing on this one because he was he was great and um, concise. You know, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to come off like I was gushing since I was doing the interview. I really do hope the guy runs for something uh, bigger in the future. I I could really get behind somebody like him for um, a national um, election of some kind. So nicest fellow in the world. Really nice, down to earth. What you guys heard was exactly the way he was. Um, he probably would have sat here longer if we'd have, if we'd have talked to him longer. I just felt, I felt bad taking up his time. Um, was there anything that you felt like we didn't get in that we should you talk about? You had something about issue? Gold Star families that you wanted to I say. I didn't right? know how to work that in because really I didn't want to put him on the spot about um, the whole Gold Star family issue with Why? Trump. I I guess I feel like I knew what he was going to. I mean I know how we all feel about that anyway. Like mm-hmm. Trump botched it. Even Republicans think he botched it. It's probably a dead issue at this I think, point. Well, the, th- the thing that impresses me the most, I think, about this guy is that he wants to talk about gerrymandering in, in the context of the de- the Democrats fucked it up for years here, too. Mm-hmm. And is, um, is, not, is not unwilling to admit, you know, some, some degree of culpability on that side on that. And is is ready to accept sort of a bar- bipartisan sort of solution to the gerrymandering problem. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if we're... I, I will say this, though, Henry, and I think this is something we all should face, as I'm assuming most of our listening audience is liberals as well. Probably. Okay, we have to remember this one little thing. If everything was done completely fairly and on the up and up, we win. So it is a tiny bit facetious because there's more there's more there's more Democrats than there are Republicans. So if you if you if you totally make things, I guess what I'm saying is I I, I don't blame the Republicans as much as as I would for for doing the gerrymandering because it's their own survival. Well, he said that they're doing way worse than we ever did. Oh, and it's it's beyond the pale right now. But what I'm saying is I can understand that the reason that when they hear us say sanctimoniously. It doesn't matter what party did this. We want everything to be fair. If everything was exactly fair, if you did the It'll districts exactly against, fair, against them. Re- Republicans would lose, which I think is the way things should be because the majority of us are Democrats. But I see their point. Nobody wants their own party to be extinct. So I see their point a little bit. But if you look at the maps of these states that have been gerrymandered, and it's not just North Carolina, it's brutal. I mean, I think he said it better than I did. I mean, I think he was trying to say at the end there, it's not hopeless, but it looks hopeless. Something else I wanted to bring out. So you, I know you saw this because I think you texted me about it, but the new P.T. Anderson movie, there's a trailer out for his new movie. It's about a guy, it looks like it's about a guy that does fashion 
It is. Like a, um, I didn't look at the details, so, so it looks great. So I don't know if people know this. This is Daniel Day-Lewis's last movie. Mm-hmm. According to Daniel Day-Lewis, he's retiring. But, um, yeah, I'm excited. I, I can't believe I'm excited about a movie that's about a fashion designer, but... Man, if he is pulls, he a designer? I don't know. If he, he looks like one, yeah, he looks like one. If he pulls this movie off for me, if he makes this interesting to me, I'm going to call him a and, master. And the trailer filmmaker. makes it look like he's not what he seems at first. Let's just say that. Okay. Don't you don't you agree? I like like the first bit of the trailer is like. I think I was so way. blown away thinking, P.T. Anderson's going to do a period piece that I might have just. It may have taken me 15 seconds to get through the, uh, the opening. You, you, you didn't think it was a period piece. You think it's now, right? No. I, I think I did pick up that I thought it was a period piece. But it seemed I weird. It, it seemed like it might have been out of time because there were times where their dress looked modern, but then there were times that it looked 1800s-ish. So. I, I keep thinking about the bit where uh, the, they sew something in the lining. Yes, of the, of the name in the lining, right. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, the, the movie is going to be called Phantom Thread, and if you haven't seen the trailer, it's online. We'll talk about that. The other thing I want to talk about, which I think w- went right to the heart of what me and you think about movies, and I posted this on Facebook. I was hoping you might have seen it. There was a 10-minute video that a guy did about David Fincher as a director. Totally missed it. Okay, so... The, the video, and I'll, I'll make sure I email it to you, Henry, and folks, uh, maybe Henry can put a link to it online. The video shows why, in this guy's opinion, uh, David Fincher's attention to detail and, and a certain thing that he does when he makes films makes you feel certain emotions and makes you feel like the characters in the movie. But once he shows you this in the video, which he'll show you scenes from all different movies and he does the same mm-hmm. thing... Um, this is the thing, that's the process. That's the part where I'm always like, look, I'm geeking out on the process, but it is actually an emotional thing. Like, he's controlling your emotions about the movie with a technical um, trick. No, not a trick, but a technical aspect of what he does. Basically, it's camera movement, um, hmm. which seems weird to say this, but basically, uh, he, has, he has actors shoot scenes 40 and 50 times, he actually is trying to get the camera person to match exactly the movements of the actor in the scene. So, like, if the scene was, Henry, you walked across the room and you turned your head quickly and then turned it back, right. the camera's going to do that as well. So the camera guy is actually having to try to mimic. Like mimicking that. Which means that they've got to choreograph it. So the camera guy's got to have a bit of a heads up before you do it that you're going to do it. So you, you can't really have a spontaneous head movement in the scene or you're going to have to do another take. They're about putting the viewer in the head of the... Well, if you watch enough of these in a row in this video, it's amazing the way it's cut. You're like, oh my God, I see what's going on here. It's like everything. It's like you're part of... And I've never... I don't know if other filmmakers do it or not. But anyway, I'll send you the link. Please um, do. I thought it was a very... It broke down succinctly the difference in what me and you were talking about where you were always saying you always look for these... Like the te- right, I always feel like you dwell on the technical aspects, but but don't often reflect back to me, uh, sort of how you feel about it. And right. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah, anything else for this episode? I think that's it. Um, uh, we got shoot. Molly Molly Brown coming up. Molly on the next. Brown's next week. Yeah, that's great. So uh, we're so excited to have her come into the kitchen and hang out with us. And if you don't know, Molly's in a band called the Mike Strauss Band, the Fat Face Band. She did a musical, which I, you know, I didn't know how to write this up. How do you, what, what is somebody that writes and directs a musical? What do you call that? What Director. But, but Writer. Of a musical? Is that how you say it? I almost the said, I think I said composer, but is that, is that correct terminology? We'd have to ask her. We'll have to ask her. If okay. she composed She's that. also done a, a podcast, so like she's, she's like a renaissance That person. musical at that club resonated hard with me. I don't know what it was. Something about it, and I think it spoke to her, her personality, who she was. I liked the context. You know, so many times you see like a rock band who just plays their rock songs. Well, folks, and you don't see like a narrative or a story around it, or, or be able to corral personalities to reflect that in a substantive way. And and that totally worked. I don't know if anybody else understands that, but I certainly did. Well, we'll get so. to the bottom of it with. The creator of that musical, Molly Brown, next week. Yep. So tune in for that. And um, 
Yeah, I think this is a great episode. Same thank, here. Thank you so much to Senator Jeff Jackson again. If you have any comments, uh, no GD Band at uh, Instagram and Twitter, and it's on Facebook. So thanks a lot. We don't need no fancy words. I mean, we need to practice. We need to rehearse. I'll tell you what we need. We need some paying gigs. We don't need this messing around first one patio and then another, and that's ridiculous. We don't got no goddamn.